Finance. Uh, topical three question has been withdrawn or no grouping. So I call Jerry Carroll. Number one. Minister. Uh, a cut in corporation tax would only be possible if it was affordable, which is not at this time given the very constrained budgetary position that we face. In addition, the political and economic landscape has changed significantly since this commitment was included in the Stormont House Agreement in 2014. Since then, we have had Brexit, the headline British rate has been reduced, and we have had successive years of austerity, which has further impacted on our ability to fund essential public services. Therefore, cutting corporation tax is not something I am considering at this time. Jerry Carl, supplementary. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, the Minister's party has um, championed tax harmonisation across the island for a number of years now. Given that he has abandoned plans to reduce corporation tax in the north, does he now support an increase in corporation tax in the south in order to harmonise the rate north and south? Well, the member will know we are dealing with different economic circumstances north and south, different availability of public finances north and south, different ability to raise our own revenues north and south. So we are not comparing apples with oranges here. Uh, the reality is, is that this, uh, this proposition was envisaged at a time when the rate in Britain was 21 per cent. It was envisaged at a time before Brexit. It was envisaged at a time before the full accumulative impact of austerity uh, has made it, in my opinion, and it's my opinion as the Minister for Finance, has made it unaffordable to this executive. Uh, and so that remains my position. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you. Will the Minister confirm that the new fiscal powers for Northern Ireland are needed, um, but they must be made in the context of properly thought through economic strategy that seeks to deepen the all island economy while also protecting trade with Britain? Yes, I agree with the member uh, in relation to that. Of course, uh, economic policy needs to be carefully thought through. We also need to have sufficient data. Uh, to make sure that economic policy is based on fact uh, and on uh, evidence. And I had that discussion with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury this morning about our access to data. Uh, but of course, uh, I, I have a signal that I want to consider uh, the, the creation of a, a fiscal commission, which will look at the idea of additional uh, economic powers and revenue raising powers for this executive. Uh, and I intend to bring forward work on that in the near future. Here from McCann. I call from McCann. And, uh, I would like to ask the, the Minister if he has had, had any engagement with the British Treasury uh, regarding our passenger uh, duty. Well, uh, I had engagement this morning, actually. I'm just back from London uh, today. And one of the issues that we did, along with the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers, ranged, uh, uh, we raised a range of issues, uh, primarily in around EU funding, but also in relation to the budget that will happen in Britain tomorrow. Uh, and I did take the opportunity to raise uh, with the Treasury the, uh, the issue of air passenger duty and the impact it has here in terms of connectivity, uh, and to ensure that the, uh, the Treasury were aware of the particular challenges that there are uh, for regions like this in relation to uh, connectivity with air passenger duty. Moving on, and I call Mervyn Storey. Uh, question number two. While not limited to mental health, the civil service recruitment process provides the opportunity to request adjustments due to disability at the application, selection and appointment stages. Fitness for post assessments may also be carried out where a special level of fitness is required to carry out the duties of the post, for example, all prison grades. In cases where mental health issues constitute a disability, line managers consider reasonable adjustments when dealing with underperformance or unsatisfactory performance. Staff moving to a new role may require fitness for post assessment depending on the duties of their new post. Mervyn Story, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Given the concerns that there are in many elements of the public sector in relation to the issue of mental health, will the Minister uh, ensure that? This is an issue which is given uh, priority and also given the fact that uh, he mentioned re uh, reasonable adjustment. Will it be the case that that reasonable adjustment will be uh, centred on the needs of the individual rather than the needs of the organisation? Yeah, I, think they, I think the civil service do recognise that they have a duty occur to all of their employees and where a member of staff raises an issue with their manager about mental health issue or where a manager notice a potential issue may be related to mental health, the civil service policy and procedures are clear that referral to occupational health service, welfare support services or other support services 
such as Inspire Workplaces, the Charity for Civil Servants or the Mediation Service should be offered as appropriate. In cases where mental health issues constitute a disability, line managers consider reasonable adjustments. So I, I would agree with them that there, of course, uh, given there's a, a, a growing focus on mental health issues, that the civil service as a responsible employer uh, needs to ensure that it is all appropriate support uh, in place. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Speaker, um, further to the, to the last question, I'd like to pay tribute to the you know, hard work done by civil servants in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. But the question I want to ask is about the age profile of the Northern Ireland civil service. In 2018, just 0.5 per cent of the Northern Ireland civil service was under the age of 25. Mr. Speaker, I think we face a crisis in terms of the age profile of our civil service. Going forward, will the minister urgently prioritise getting um, lowering the age profile of our civil service, not because they're not hardworking, but in order to deal with the challenges that face us, not least Brexit, but also the climate emergency and a variety of other things, we need to have a younger age profile in our civil service. Well, I, I think it's, it's uh, certainly uh, desirable that you have a very balanced, in terms of gender and age profile, uh, workforce in relation to civil service. The member has to take into account the impact of austerity over nine years and the ability to recruit. Uh, additional people which may have, have slowed down, I suppose, the, that turnover in terms of staff and recruitment of new members and younger members into the civil service. And of course, uh, that's something we'd like to see, but we can't just simply push people out the other end in order to create a, a more age profile balanced uh, workforce. Uh, but nonetheless, I would hope if the situation improves uh, that we are able to continue uh, to recruit into the civil service and that there is a drive to ensure that the, the workforce re reflects the, the, the age balance of the population generally. Nicole Sean Lynch. Margaret, uh, can, call, uh, can the Minister give an update on the review of the civil service provided in the New Deal, New Decade document? Gourmet. Well, the, the member will know that the, uh, there are a number of areas of work uh, as a consequence of that. The, uh, issue in relation to special advisors, which I brought a paper to the executive, the issue in relation to the improvements to the ministerial code, uh, again, which a paper has been uh, drafted and sent to the executive. And all of this uh, is work that flows from the, the workshops that took place over the course of last summer among the five parties who are uh, entitled to be in the executive. And the, the civil service code uh, is, is currently in process of being developed. Uh, and obviously, we will want, uh, as with all of these codes and the development of, of greater transparency and accountability and scrutiny. We we'll want to take account of what the uh, report this Friday uh, recommends as well and make sure that that is factored into any development of that. Moving on, I call Trevor Clark. Question number three. I have had a number of meetings with the Treasury over the last few weeks, including as recently as this morning. Uh, I had made, I had made the previous Chief Secretary of the Treasury, now Chancellor Rishi Sunak, aware that the cost of delivering the priorities set out in New Decade New Approach far outweigh the funding package set out by the British Government. This conversation has continued with the new Chief Secretary of the Treasury. I am also continuing to seek the reinstatement of the outstanding £240 million of confidence and supply funding. Trevor Clark, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Given that we have heard you, Minister, citing so many times the pressures currently on the budgets, how then will you as the Finance Minister decide what takes priority in relation to the new decade, new approach document, or what just drops off? Well, it will be for the Executive to decide the priorities uh, and uh, a number of the projects. Uh, and I have to say, I am sure the Member will be aware that the commitments which were given in the New Deck and New Approach document were not commitments, weren't part of some wish list that the parties just threw into the mix. They were carefully worked through between all of the parties, senior civil servants from the Northern Ireland office, senior civil servants from uh, the, the departments here, including the head of the civil service. So those approaches focused primarily on uh, reform uh, in relation to health, in relation to education, in relation to justice, and to try and ensure that we had adequate support to bring forward uh, those programmes. Uh, so this wasn't just something that was grasped out of the air. So the executive uh, agreed those priorities, and if we continue to fall short, and I, I have not given up in terms of trying to secure that fund, and I will continue to engage with the British Treasury in relation to that. But if we, the, the fund and packets that's available, the priorities then attached to that will be decided by the executive as a whole. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Karen uh, the, the Minister, in response to Mr Clark's question, referred to the outstanding £240 million from the Confidence and Supply uh, deal. Can the Minister 
uh, Tallah House uh, if that money has been withdrawn by the British Government? Well, as such, uh, what we have had is a, a, a verbal report from a previous British Secretary of State to say that that uh, money no longer existed, even though there had been an agreement with his government uh, to reprofile some of that, particularly in relation to broadband funding. There is also some element of it in relation to mental health issues and uh, an element in relation to deprivation. So there are very, obviously very key projects and ones which would attract a widespread degree of support across uh, this House. Uh, we have had that verbal report. We have not managed to have that confirmed from the Treasury. The NIO have been singularly unhelpful in trying to ensure that we secure this money or indeed the money they are committed to in the new decade new approach. But nonetheless, we continue to pursue that case with the Treasury. I call Jim Allister. Has the Minister's officials yet costed out everything that is in New Decade, New Approach? And if so, what is that total figure? And is the extra money still standing at only £760 million? The, uh, Yes, as, as has been outlined in the, in the package from uh, the Secretary of State, uh, where he outlined what he declared was two, bil or two billion, one, one billion of that, as the member will know, is Barnet consequences, which would have come to us anyway. Uh, of the other billion, which they declared to be new money, about 240,000 of that uh, is, is, had, would have to compensate for the money they have removed from confidence supply. So that leaves about 750 million. The work undertaken within the departments has identified resource stale costs in relation to your approach uh, in 2021, 2020 to 2021, amounting to 1.2 billion resource and 0.6 billion capital. Departments have estimated the total cost of time bound interventions to be 1.5 billion resource and 7.5 billion capital, with the annual cost of continued intervention estimated at 1.2 billion resource and 0.3 billion capital Dale. Clearly, that is significantly above the financial package set out by the previous Secretary of State. Well, John Blair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask Mr. Speaker if the Minister is seeking this additional funding from Treasury on the basis of a package of agreed reforms? Well, I think it was, it was very clear, as I say, the, the, the parties to that discussion uh, at, the, at the end of the negotiations to re-establish these institutions were very clear, uh, all of the parties, as were the senior civil servants that we were talking to about the, the money that was required and the purpose for it, and, and the core purpose of it was in relation to reform. Uh, so that's the case. We have had that costed, uh, and we have presented that to the Treasury in relation to the, the commitments that the British Government at that time made, uh, and which it has not lived up to since. Following the uh, UK budget uh, the coming Wednesday, what chance will the Minister have, or when will he have that opportunity to update the Assembly on its consequences, please? Well, uh, intention is to be talking, uh, as I said, to respond to early questions. I did have a meeting with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury this morning in London, uh, along with the Scottish and the Welsh finance ministers, and there are a range of issues put to them. There will be contact between myself and the Treasury tomorrow when the budget is announced to get a sense of what uh, consequences might flow from it to us. Uh, obviously, I will have to then bring uh, budget propositions. As the member will know, we, we delayed the budget until we were uh, sure of what may emerge from tomorrow's budget in Britain. Uh, and then I would have to bring propositions around that to the executive to try and agree a budget. The intention is to bring that back to this House for debate and approval on the 30th of March. Moving on, I call Christopher Stalford. Question number four, sir. My understanding of land banking is the practice of speculator acquiring land uh, and then holding on to it without taking any action to develop it or to make use of it. I am sure that many members will be aware of this practice as acting as a blockage to much needed development in their own constituencies. The reasons for developers acquiring and holding land are varied. It is important to point, point out that site assembly is an important and legitimate part of the development process. For example, social housing providers assemble land for the purposes of new housing development. I would not wish to do anything that would discourage the assembly of sites for socially beneficial development. However, there are cases of land banking which do not deliver any benefits, such as when a developer buys land simply to speculate on capital gains and does not have any genuine intention of bringing forward a development. I want to look at options available to, damaging, uh, to address the damaging forms of land banking and encourage development to be brought forward quickly. Christopher Stafford, supplementary. I am very grateful to the Minister for his answer because it addresses precisely the concern that I have, particularly in inner-city Belfast areas where there is a dire need 
for increased social housing building, but we have a situation where private developers are engaging in exactly the sort of practice that the Minister has outlined. I wonder, has the Department considered or is in the process of considering some sort of a levy upon holding land like this in order to encourage private developers to release it for public use? Well, I, I, I am aware, as, as the member has outlined, of one site in the Donegal Pass area uh, that is to be acquired by a nominated housing association with funding provided through the Executive Office's Urban Village Initiatives, and the transfer is anticipated completed this year. But in relation to the broader question, of course, as I say, there is, is genuine acquiring of land and, 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 and pooling of land for intended development, and there is the issue which uh, very largely affects urban areas, and particularly inner city areas where land is speculated upon and acquired and sat on in order to see what the conditions of the market uh, do. Uh, there are, I suppose, a couple of ways that this can be approached. One is through the, the rating review uh, in relation to that land and, and what rates are applied to it and the, in, to derelict properties and derelict sites. Uh, another one is, uh, as I answered the previous question, if we are to acquire additional uh, fiscal powers, then is there uh, an opportunity to put a, a tax in relation to uh, properties uh, such as that, which aren't clearly not uh, intended for any uh, immediate use in terms of development. So there are a couple of ways to approach this, and I intend to consider that in the time ahead and see which is most appropriate. Remember, Dagnan Magalier, I call Dagnan Magalier. Uh, uh, Ken Corlea, the Minister has partially answered my question. Uh, has he given some active consideration to introducing a derelict land tax that perhaps would uh, discourage speculative land banking? Well, I think that, as, as I said in the previous answer, I think that that practice where you can clearly identify that that's what's going on, and as I said, we, we need to be certain that that is uh, actually what's happening then. Uh, of course, I think it is something because we have uh, a need for social housing, we have a need to ensure development, uh, in, particularly in our urban areas, uh, for housing and to make sure that, that land isn't sat on uh, and, and becomes a blight then to the communities in, in which it's, it's located. Uh, so, of, of course, uh, that may be one option in terms of derelict land tax. What we have uh, to do is to bring forward uh, a fiscal commission to look at the additional revenue raising powers that the executive might have. Uh, or the, as I say, the other way to address this may be as part of the broader rates review to see how that land can be brought in under that. I call Joanne Bunting. Mr Speaker, question five, please. The hospitality sector is very important to the economy here, and as an executive, we want to do all we can to support it. However, it also needs to be recognised that it pays 3% of all business rates, and that currently 60% of pubs benefit from rate relief through the small business rate relief. Going forward, I'll be considering the options for all relief provisions for 2021 and beyond in the context of the business rates consultation and the wider budget issues that face us as an executive. If not already done so, I would encourage any hospitality proprietor unhappy with the proposed revaluation assessment to raise the matter with the Land and Property Service in my department. Joanne Bunting, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer, um, although I'm still not clear whether or not his department has given consideration to mitigation members. If he has, I'd be grateful if he would outline what those mitigation measures may be and also to indicate whether or not he'd be willing to meet representatives from the sector to address this problem directly. Well, as I said, 60% of pubs benefit from the small business rate relief scheme already. Uh, I have met uh, representatives from the hospitality sector, both hotels and pubs. Uh, I, I, I think an arrangement to meet them again in the near future to discuss these issues. Uh, I would encourage uh, not a bill has been issued yet, so there are opportunities for people who are unhappy with the revaluation exercise to challenge that to provide additional information uh, in relation to the turnover that their premises have to, uh, if they consider the assessment to be too high. I know that has happened on a number of occasions. I know that has had an effect of changing uh, what that assessment would be. So I would encourage members to do that in the first instance. And of course, beyond this year, and we are in a fairly tight time frame in, in terms of rates this year, beyond this year, we will be into a full-scale review of the entire rating system. I call Justin McNulty. Um, the SDLP brought a motion to Belfast City Council last night to support businesses who may face uh, challenges in relation to the coronavirus. The Irish government has provided £200 million, uh, liquidity fund to support businesses who will face challenges as a result of the coronavirus. Can I ask the Minister whether he is considering putting in place mitigation measures to assist businesses in the hospitality sector and businesses in general who may be facing closure as a result of the coronavirus? 
Well, I think that the, uh, the response to that, as I, I mean, listened into some of the, the questions for the education minister, is clearly unfolding. Uh, there is increasing concern, I think, and rightly so, as to the impact not only on our health service and our health system, uh, and people's health generally, but also in terms of economic damage. We did have a discussion this morning uh, in the Treasury with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, with both the Scottish and the Welsh finance ministers, about ensuring that there is an appropriate level of support uh, from them in relation to whatever difficulties we may face as a consequence of this. Uh, so I would intend to continue that conversation with them to ensure that as this unfolds, and, uh, uh, and none of us as yet knows what the full impact may be, but as it unfolds that we continue to ensure that we can access uh, levels of support. The executive does have an ability to uh, go into uh, uh, to access some uh, resource in relation to this, but we want to ensure that if there is a step up in terms of the approach from the Treasury, then that we get the associated uh, support from that. I call Emma Rogan. Can Cordia, the Minister has answered my question about the um, small business relate, relate, re, can't speak, reach relief in his previous answer? Thank you. Thank you. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would like to ask the Minister, um, given the fact that the, the revaluation occurred on the 1st of April 2018, there are those um, pubs and, and, and hotels that have had significant changes have happened to them since that. If they submit evidence um, of the impact of their business that happened after the 1st of April 2018, will that be taken into consideration in a revaluation? Well, I, I know that the uh, people in the department that I've spoken to are encouraging people right up to this point. To, to submit evidence. So uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming from that that any evidence right up to the point that they submitted is valid. Uh, and of course, uh, I think that we also are conscious that if there is, uh, in relation to the previous answer, if, there's relation to our, uh, if there are issues in relation to economic impact of coronavirus, but it probably would be felt uh, primarily in the hospitality sector, uh, because you may see a restriction on travel. Uh, and tourism. Uh, so, of, of course, we want to look to see what, uh, what supports we can provide. But as I said uh, in, in response to the first question, we would encourage people who consider the revaluation exercise to be damaging to them to submit that additional information. Where it has already been done, I am aware that it has resulted in a change in assessment. I call on Morris Bradley. Mr. Speaker, question six. <coughs> The new decade new approach document identified both support for city deal packages and the expansion of McGee, including a graduate entry medical school, as priorities for an incoming executive. Of course, all expenditure requires approval. This usually takes the form of a business case. The Ulster University is developing a business case for the medical school at McGee. On completion, the business case must be formally submitted to a civil service department for expenditure appraisal. It is, it is for the responsible uh, accounting officer to provide the necessary assurances to the Department of Finance usually through the business case process, that the project is value for money, affordable and meets the requirements in respect of propriety and regularity. Maurice Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Can I thank the Minister for his response and his answer? Uh, but it's important to remember McGee is a campus of the Ulster University, and I would ask that its sister campus at Corian be included uh, as vital to the regeneration of the whole North West region, region, including Corian and Lima Valley. Uh, as together in collaboration we can achieve much more than, than we can do in isolation. Thank you. Well, I congratulate the member for getting his constituency interest in, <laughs> on another question, but uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the business case in this, in this regard is in relation to graduate entry medical school in McGee. I have no doubt that any investment in the North West, including uh, Korean uh, benefits the entire North West. Uh, what we want to see is there is a commitment from this executive. It is matched by a commitment from the British Government. The Irish Government have indicated that they would also be committed to supporting uh, the development of McGee. Uh, so we want to see that. And I have no doubt that a successful business case and a successful development and expansion of McGee would be a benefit to the much broader North West region, including Korea. I call Karen Mullen. I welcome the Minister's ongoing commitments to Derry and ask, does the Minister intend to provide financial support for the North West City Deal? and the Inclusive Future Fund in line with the commitments in the New Decade New Approach? Well, as part of the uh, New Decade New Approach financial package, the, as I say, the Government uh, in Britain committed to providing £45 million of capital funding to the Inclusive Future Fund. The Executive uh, can also choose to contribute through its own funds, and the, as I say, the Irish Government has expressed a commitment to exploring uh, opportunities for investment to bring greater economic prosperity. Uh, the pack, financial package also provided an additional 15 million 
resource funding to meet some of the recurrent costs of the project. It's not clear at this time what period the resource funding is available over. Of course, uh, we have to bring a paper to the executive in terms of support for the city deal and the inclusive future fund. I intend to do that in the near future, and my own support for this project is, is well on the record. And I call Mark Durgan. Thank the Minister for his answer until now. Uh, I welcome the fact that this paper will be brought to the Executive soon. It's always been anticipated that the Executive would need to match fund uh, what had been announced by the UK Government last May. Uh, can the Minister give a commitment to work with other Executive colleagues uh, collaboratively in other ways that might help address the economic and infrastructural deficit in the North West? Yes, I, I certainly can give that commitment. I had the opportunity to visit Derry last week, uh, and I met uh, council representatives, I met Chamber of Commerce uh, people, I met people in the uh, Free Derry Museum, I also met some of the uh, social enterprise and community projects. Uh, and so there are a wide range of interventions uh, that would be required in Derry in order to support and, and assist it in growing economically and, and being, uh, as its potential uh, allows it to be, the, the centre of economic development in the North West region. Of course, uh, I had an opportunity as also to engage with the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ulster when I was in Derry and discuss the centrality of the McGee project to all of that development. And that's a consistent message from everybody that I did meet in Derry in relation to that. But of course there are a range of interventions. I'm more than happy to talk to other executive colleagues about what assistance they can also provide, because I think uh, it's not simply a matter of one department can up and doing one thing. This requires a broad executive approach to support in the North West. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I wish to ask the Minister what representation he has made to the Treasury in relation to the borrowed coincidentals resulting from the infrastructure spend in the forthcoming Westminster budget. Uh, well, as I have said in, re in response to some earlier questions, I have just returned from a meeting with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and uh, with the Scottish and Welsh counterparts this morning where the budget was discussed. Uh, the member might be aware that Barnet consequentials are received when new funding is announced by the British Government. This is an established process, so there is no need to make representation on the specifics of Barnet consequentials to the Treasury, but obviously we will be watching with interest tomorrow to see what announcements there are in the budget and working and assessing uh, what consequence that has for our own budget. And the member will be aware, being a member of the Finance Committee, that we did take a decision to delay our own budget to beyond tomorrow to see what these consequences may be. Pat Catney, so many with one uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Minister, it was just more to see, as you try to finalise or you're working through on your budget, to see where that extra money and I, we keep hearing about the shortfall that we have at the moment. And I want to know is that bridged at the moment for us going forward? Well, of course, it's up to the executive uh, to decide what to do. That uh, any barn consequences don't come ring fenced, so they do. But the anticipation, I suppose, if if we are to read the signals that have come from the, the British Treasury are that there will be quite a substantial increase in spent on infrastructure uh, and obviously that comes as capital uh, and would have to be spent on capital projects. There are, every department has capital ambitions and uh, in, in some of the, the bids that they have submitted to the Department of Finance. So, uh, but it will be up to the executive to decide in line with its own priorities how to spend that money as it arrives. Uh, moving on now to topical questions and I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I think the, the Minister has part answered previously, enemy, but uh, I was just to ask the Minister, in light of the statement delivered yesterday to the House by the Health Minister uh, regarding the COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, is finance available to the Health Minister and possibly the Education Minister should Northern Ireland have to move to the next stage from containment to uh, sustained transmission? Well, the, uh, as I said, I discussed the issue this morning with the Treasury and with the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers uh, present as well, and we collectively made the case. The executive will receive a share of any additional funding provided for a, 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 a response to the coronavirus from the Treasury. Uh, however, it will be possible to make representations for further funding should that be necessary. The executive is also able to access the reserve in the same way as Whitehall departments and the other devolved administrations for any exceptional and unforeseen circumstances which cannot easily be easily absorbed without a major dislocation of existing services. So, obviously, as I have said in response to other questions, this is an unfolding uh, situation. The uh, experience in other countries uh, rightly leads us to be increasingly concerned about what the impact will have in terms of public health, strain on the health service, and then 
uh, an effect on other public services and in the economy generally. So we have had that discussion. Uh, as, as money is made available to deal with that from London, then we should have our share in relation to all of that. If we have additional uh, issues above and beyond that, then we have the right to go and make the case for that. Ross Bradley, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. <clears throat> I would be an optimist, uh, optimist by nature and would be hopeful that that situation would not arise, but it is vit vital to have forward planning in place in case it does. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, it's, I think uh, I listen to the Education Minister saying that we, we are acting and we had advice from the, the Chief Medical Officer at the, executive, the last executive meeting. Uh, obviously, the Health Minister is updating us on a very regular basis in terms of the latest medical advice, and that continues to assess where we are. And, and as you can see, uh, both in terms of the South, uh, in terms of Britain, that advice is, is continuing to evolve over time. Uh, and so we obviously have to be very conscious of that. We have to be very conscious of the public alarm uh, in relation uh, to what's developing and make sure that we are equipped to try and deal with all of that as best we can, but based on sound medical advice. Call Keeva Archibald. Minister, last week the Translink Chief Executive says he, he wrote to you seeking a meeting on his organisation's funding. Can the Minister indicate if that meeting has yet taken place? Well, no, it hasn't, uh, because I, I did meet uh, as part of my budgetary discussions. I met with the Minister for, Minister for Infrastructure, and uh, she updated me on the entirety of the pressures in her own department, including uh, Translink, which is a component part within their departments. As part of those preparations, I have met all ministers to discuss the financial pressures within their departments. It would then be very executive as a whole to agree the departmental allocation as part of the budget. Uh, and it's, it's my preference, of course, that the financial pressures which all departments are subject to are discussed and addressed in a collegiate and collective way. So I haven't undertaken the practice of meeting component parts of any department. Uh, it's up to the minister for, uh, responsible for that to make the case for her particular area. Archibald, supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. Um, Minister, you said that you have discussed the, the financial pressures with, with um, the various departments. Uh, could you outline what the scale of the collective financial pressure um, facing the executive is? Well, if you assessment of all of the, uh, the uh, inescapable pressures that there have been presented by all of the departments, there's a shortfall of six hundred million. Uh, that's before you even factor in the commitments under the new decade and new approach. Uh, agreement which have yet to be uh, accepted and delivered upon by the British Government. I call Mervyn Storey. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister made reference to the fact that he was with the Treasury earlier on uh, today. And will he inform the House as to what conversations he's had with the Treasury in relation to meeting the commitment uh, in the political agreement to increase the numbers of the PSNI? Because obviously uh, we hear a lot from members in regards to their commitment to Patton. And Patton, of course, uh, indicated that in peace times, and we have had, unfortunately, those who are still prepared to murder on our streets, uh, will the minister be able to say that the commitment to 7,500 officers will be met and it will be delivered as in the political agreement? Well, the, the, the job I've been tasked with by the executive is to go and secure the commitments that were made by the British government as part of the new decade uh, new approach document. Uh, that's what I've been trying to do. That's across a whole range uh, of pressures and, as I say, proposals which were carefully worked through uh, were encouraged by the NIO at the time to be brought forward uh, with a very strong indication that they would be delivered upon if an agreement was possible. Uh, and all parties acted in good faith in relation to that. And in our sense, we've lived up to the political commitments that we made in relation to the new decade, new approach. If we were to have the kind of same blasé approach to living up to commitments as the British government did, this institution wouldn't be sitting here today discussing these matters. Uh, so parties lived up to their commitments, and it's up to the government to live up to their own commitments. Those are across a range of areas, as I indicated earlier, in relation to health transformation, in relation to uh, education transformation, also in relation to justice transformation. I know there's a specific reference to an additional, I think, 700 uh, police officers. Uh, and of course, what I'm trying to do is secure the commitments that were made so we can deliver across all of those areas. Firm story, supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister. He will also be aware of the Audit Office today uh, making reference to the fact that there is an additional 500 million pressure on injury and duty payments in relation to pensions. This comes in the back of the Schofield report, 
which was in the hands of the then Justice Minister David Ford, which unfortunately it seems as though hasn't been enacted in the way that it should have been. And therefore, we have today still a pressure of 500 million. When you put all that together, Minister, uh, with the existing pressures that the police service of Northern Ireland face, how do you see the executive uh, prioritising, given the fact that the new decade, new approach says we will? It's not aspirational. It's not, as some other parts of the document are, uh, less than woolly. It actually states we will increase the numbers to 7,500. Yeah, and can I, I remind the member, I don't, probably will not need to, that document was written by both governments. It wasn't written by the political parties of the executive, it was written by both governments. So the we will uh, was a commitment from both governments, which primarily in the case of the additional uh, police personnel was a, a commitment from the British government. Uh, and that's why I think it's important that they live up to those commitments. It's not acceptable uh, for two parties, or five parties and two governments to come to an agreement and one government to decide that they don't need to honour the commitments that they made to that. They call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, during question time yesterday with the Minister of Communities, um, there was a debate around housing and the housing executive going forward. And she had mentioned that she had had conversations with yourself, and you've also said in question time today about conversations with Treasury. Um, we know the importance in uh, our housing executive going forward, being able to borrow, and also the debt that it's in. Just if you could give us an update on that. Well, I think the, the, what brought, I suppose, this issue into acute relief, and I know it's been an ambition to, to get the housing executive back into a position where it could build houses again, to make sure that we were making best use uh, of the, the resource that we have in housing uh, in order to raise more capital. And I suppose what brought it into acute relief over the last year was the inability to access financial transaction capital, uh, which had to be then uh, surrendered back to the, to the uh, Treasury. Uh, so, of course, the, uh, I'm working closely with the Minister for Communities. Uh, she has indicated that she wants to bring forward proposition to deal with this so that they are in a position to access that capital. And I have undertaken to do all uh, in relation to my own powers within my own department to, to support her and assist her in, in doing that, because I think it's important that we uh, are able, not just for those who are, who are in dire need of housing on the housing list, but for the economy generally, to be able to access that and to start to stimulate economic growth, uh, as well as build houses for those in need. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his detailed answer? And I, I, I know again, I'm talking about Department of Communities, but you do have a, a, a strong part to play in going forward in this. And it's just asking for your commitment going forward. We have so many of our people who are in housing need and housing stress in all of our constituencies, and this issue needs addressed as a matter of priority. Yes, and I agree with the member, and that's why myself and the Minister for Communities have set up a joint working arrangement with senior uh, people between our two cells, but also with senior people in both departments, to make sure that uh, whatever processes are needed to be uh, moved forward, that there isn't a disconnect between the both departments in relation to that. We have a shared ambition, which I think is matched across the executive, to make sure that we do provide housing to those most in need, uh, and that we do use that to actually stimulate economic growth as well. Uh, and so, uh, certainly, there's a, a very firm commitment for both myself and the Minister for Communities to work together on these issues. I call Jerry Carl. Um, can the Minister detail what discussion he um, has initiated, if any, with his counterparts in Westminster about closing corporation tax loopholes, which allow for uh, evasion and avoidance to the tune of billions of pounds every single year in tax evasion and avoidance? Well, I think, uh, the, the, as I had said to him in, in response to the previous question, I have not initiated any uh, action on corporation tax. The, the power was not devolved. Uh, the circumstances, I believe, uh, don't merit to be devolved in this instance. If there are issues of people using uh, company law and various taxation loopholes to evade uh, proper uh, contributions from their business, it would be a crossover between both the economy department and the finance department. And if the member has evidence that he wishes to bring forward in relation to that, I would certainly be happy to take it up with Treasury officials. Jerry Carl, supplementary. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister will probably be aware tax evasion and avoidance stands at the tune of at least tens of billions of pounds uh, every single year. Does the Minister agree that addressing this gap and tackling tax evasion and tax avoidance potentially allows for more money to be invested in our public services? Well, it does, but as tax is paid primarily to the British Treasury, that's where the money would go to if, if the avoidance and, uh, and uh, those loopholes are closed and, and the money is secured. So then, I, I suppose, on the basis that they have more money to distribute, we might get some proportion of that. So, of course, uh, we would want to ensure 
uh, that as, as people pursue uh, those who they accuse of benefit fraud and various things that are in the very low level of the scale, that there's a similar enthusiasm in pursuing those who are involved in tax evasion uh, as well, uh, and, and that that money is returned back to uh, be distributed then across public services. And that's an ambition I would share, but it's unfortunately not a responsibility of this institution, but a responsibility of London. I call Martina Anderson. Good morning, August. Um, Minister, you already gave an assessment of your visit to Derry last week, and I, I thank you for that visit and all of the organisations that you engaged with. One of them that you engaged with was Destin, um, an organisation that deals with vulnerable adults. And unfortunately, you did that on the back of an awful, appalling arson attack that destroyed the kitchen. And therefore, can you provide Destin with some advice as to how they could get maybe a temporary kitchen? as they wait for the repairs to take place? Well, I, I was uh, delighted to get the opportunity to visit. Uh, I mean, I'm a great admirer of, of, of the range of social enterprise projects, but particularly those which help very vulnerable people, as, as the Destin project does. Uh, and you couldn't help but be inspired by visiting that project and talking to people, but also to see the determination uh, to overcome uh, the, the setback that uh, that thoughtless and, 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 and cruel attack on the building uh, had and the response from the local community in terms of providing support to that project uh, I think shows the value that it has. I did range, raise the issue with officials when I got back to the department to try and ensure that if there was possible to give any assistance uh, to that project which is providing such a valuable community service uh, that they do that and I know that, that they have intended to speak to people in the Department of Communities to ensure that assistance is provided. Martina Anderson, supplementary. Um, Minister, could uh, that information be relayed to Destin so that they have a contact point at both your, in your office and in the Department of the Communities? Well, I'm sure we could do that. And uh, as I say, I, I have asked my own officials to speak to communities, uh, uh, people in the Department of Communities, to make sure they reach out to that project because, as I say, it's providing such a valuable community service. Uh, and we, we uh, an unfortunate victim uh, of a criminal attack, uh, and we want to ensure that it continues to provide that support that it does. So, of course, we will be in contact. With them. I call Roy Beggs, and you wouldn't have time for a supplementary, just a phase of member. <coughs> The, uh, we've been discussing the, uh, the uh, budget process. Can the Minister give an undertaking when exactly a new process will come in, which will be much more encompassing, which will include the, the public in a much wider basis uh, and provide a much healthier politics? Well, it's something that, as the member reminded me in an earlier debate, it was, uh, with that suggestion was brought forward when I was chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, and that initiative came from the Finance Committee to get a much more transparent, uh, I don't mean in terms of things that are hidden, but a much more understandable uh, and accessible budget process so that members of the public as well as members of this institution can engage with it. Uh, so I, I will undertake to talk to officials in the department to see uh, where those propositions landed, how they've been dealt with over time. And I think it is in our interest to get to a much more manageable process because we ended up la in the last couple of weeks having a budget debate in effect on an issue which is about uh, retrospective spend. Uh, it wasn't about future spend at all, but many people, uh, particularly in this chamber, I think get a false impression as to how the budget process actually works and what we were debating at that particular time. So I think it is in all our interest to get a much more accessible, uh, understandable, clear process going forward. And I certainly will engage with officials in the finance department and see how that can be done. And, and time is up. Thank you, members. Could the members take a raise for one moment, please? <coughs>